thank you. We're going to get started now. All right. Um, first, I'm going to ask the uh, members uh, to introduce themselves before I turn it over to the witnesses, um, starting to my left. Hi, I'm uh, Kieran Tester, member for Cam Lake and deputy chair of the Priorities and Planning Committee. Corey Van Thine, MLA for Yellowknife North. Caroline Cochran, MLA for Range Lake. Shane Thompson, MLA for Nandy. Good afternoon, Herb Nakamai. Welcome, Frederick Blake, MLA for Mackenzie Delta. Good afternoon, Lucy Burke, Tabacho. Uh, Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. Good afternoon, RJ Simpson, Hay River North. Michael Murray, MLA for Ditcho. Danny McNeely, MLA for Santu Region. And I'm uh, Tom MLA for Tuneda uh, and Willoughby. I'd like to uh, welcome the uh, <clears throat> Coalition Against uh, Family Violence, NWT. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Ms. Vanuf for introduction of the officials that she has with her at the main table. Ms. Vanuf. Thank you, Mr. Bolio. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Lorraine Fanoff. I'm with the Status of Women Council. Uh, to my left is Lida Fuller. She's the Executive Director for the YWC. And Laura Boileau is with a New Day program with the Tree of Peace Friendship Centre. And behind me are many fellow coalition members. Um, there's quite a few, so <laughs> I think I'll just leave it at that. And thank you very much for uh, agreeing to see us today. Uh, thank you. Um, with that, I think uh, uh, we don't have any open comments. We'd uh, turn it over to you for uh, your presentation. Thank you. Today I'm here to present to you on behalf of the Coalition Against Family Violence. The Coalition is a group of concerned people who work together on family violence issues. Its members include territorial and community-based groups, GNWT government departments and individuals. It was formed in 1999 when government and non-government organizations began meeting in Yellowknife. It envisions peaceful, equitable society where all NWG residents, as individuals, members of families, communities, organizations, or governments, are valued, respected, safe, and free from abuse and inequalities. It wants to provide the public with an accurate picture of family violence and its impacts on families and communities. The document you have been sent to you in advance includes our history, some key priorities and rationales. And while we feel that although we have made progress in the area of family violence and that we have many dedicated folks working in this area, our rates of, value of violence and stats remain high, with many families' reality being one of violence or witnessing violence. The strategic direction in ending family violence at NWT has been prepared to provide an update on services currently available. It also includes the strategic directions the coalition hopes the GNWT will consider to address family violence in the north. According to Statistics Canada statistical profile released on January 15, 2015, the Northwest Territories has epidemic rates of family violence that are nine times the national average placing the NWT in second place for the highest rates of violence in Canada. Family violence does not only affect those who are abused, but it also has a substantial effect on family members, friends, co-workers, other witnesses, the economy, and the community at large. Children who grow up witnessing domestic violence are among those seriously affected by this crime. The NWT has four times the national rate for family violence against victims under 17 years of age. We are also 17 times the national average for violence against victims who are seniors. I'll explain a little bit about our history. In response to the prevalence of family violence, attempts to address it in a strategic way have been made. In 2003, the government of the Northwest Territories responded to the Coalition Against Family Violence call to action. Since then, the GNWT and the Coalition Against Family Violence have worked in partnership on many initiatives framed within the two key action plans, which ran 2003 to 2007, 2007 to 2012. These action plans have resulted in additional services and programming, as well as implementation of funding, which has helped stabilize some initiatives. A comprehensive continuum of programs and services for both victims and perpetrators are an essential part of an overall strategy to end family violence. 
In 2011, the coalition released 19 recommendations. The report recommendations for addressing gaps, shifting attitudes, and enhancing services to reduce family violence in the NWT. Since then, some of those recommendations have been addressed and funded by the GNWT, but there is still much work to be done. Nonprofit organizations also continue to work on projects and research funded by various levels of government, industry, and the community continue to work. To further understand the situation in the NWT, a family violence report card was developed by the Coalition Against Family Violence in 2013. This tool review, reviewed services available as well as identified gaps for families impacted by violence. A second report card is due to come out in the next year. For many families in the NWT, family violence is a harsh reality. It can happen to anyone, regardless of race, age, sexual orientation, religion, or gender. It affects people of all socioeconomic backgrounds and education levels. Family violence occurs in both opposite sex and same sex relationships, and can happen to intimate partners who are married, living together, or dating. In a two day meeting in the fall, the coalition met, spent time looking, at some recommendations to improve our current family violence services and explore new directions to eradicate violence in the North. Today, we will touch on three of those recommendations for your consideration around prevention, emergency responses, and healing. Our first recommendation around prevention could be addressed by naming family violence and working to change our social responses Working to address the normalization of family violence is an important long-term project that will lead to lower rates of violence in northern communities. The primary recommendation for this is to update the 2007 NWP Family Violence Attitudinal Survey to support the delivery of a complete family violence campaign, applying social marketing principles. Second, uh, an emergency response is it is important to enhance emergency response options for victims of family violence by taking into account the unique needs of communities and regions while ensuring consistent emergency services are available. Today, Leiter Fuller will speak to our second recommendation, adequate and consistent funding for shelters and victim services. Our third primary uh, priority is healing. It is crucial that we invest in a permanent community-based therapy program for those who have used, experienced, or witnessed violence in the Northwest Territories. Approaching the needs of those that are experiencing violence or perpetrating violence with a holistic and relevant options that result in improved outcomes can only help. I will begin the priorities by speaking a bit about the prevention key, key priority. And here he goes. A complete family violence campaign applying social marketing principles could be delivered by using the 2007 attitudinal survey as a baseline to run a pre-survey to see if attitudes towards violence have changed in the last 10 years, and then a post-social marketing campaign survey to see if attitudes have further changed. This could be built into an evaluation strategy for the campaign which builds in a survey component to monitor if attitudes have changed in regular intervals. Another recommendation is to continue to use the what will it take bystander training for family violence and create a full marketing campaign built on changing attitudes while using social marketing principles, similar to campaigns you would see on smoking, such as don't be a butthead or drinking and driving campaigns. Recommendation three would be to to continue to run what will it take workshops, as we have seen firsthand how community workshops are beneficial and are important to form relationships with community members, but also to have a complete strategy, having promotional pieces that are not only based on workshops, but on television commercials, community displays, promotional items, con contests, peace awards, plays, text talks, social media plays, and etc. Um, so that is my piece. Thank you for listening. And next we will have Lyda Fuller. Thank you, uh, Ms. Finna, Ms. Fuller. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I just want to say that I have been involved with operating women's shelters for 30 years and for the last eight years have done capacity building work with the family violence shelters in this territory. 
We at the YBCA operate two of the shelters that are in the NWT, the one here in Yellowknife, Alice and McAteer House, and Sutherland House in Fort Smith. So I, I've been around shelters for a long time and know how they run and, and uh, the kinds of things that they do and what they need, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. You probably know that there are five family violence shelters in the NWT, and they've been around for a number of years. So there's yell one in Yellowknife, one in Hay River, one in Fort Smith, one in Inuvik, and one in Tuk, Tuyak Tuk. So what do shelters do? Why is it important that we have uh, <coughs> stable shelters in the NWT? Well, first of all, they keep women alive and they prevent uh, further injury. They also provide for the physical and psychological safety and security of women and children who are experiencing domestic violence. So you'll find in shelters locked doors and you'll find camera systems. And you'll find if you call a shelter, they won't actually disclose if a woman is there. They'll say, you know, if she's here, we'll give her a message. They provide a nurturing environment and basic necessities of life in ways that preserve dignity. So shelters provide food and, you know, if a woman comes in without uh, extra clothing or a toothbrush or those kinds of things, shelters do that. They also minimize women's isolation and desolation through contacts with staff who can provide reassurance that this is not you know, only pertaining to that woman or unusual. They also interact with other women in the shelter that they have things in common with. So they don't feel so isolated and alone. Um, it helps, shelters help women reestablish control over their lives. So, you know, you'll sit with women and say, um, you know, what would you like to do? How do you think this can be resolved? Um, and make basic plans and do safety planning because we know in the NWT women go back many times to partners often uh, don't want to leave partners and that's fine. We don't encourage them to leave. We just say to them, you need a safety plan. You need a way to keep yourself and your children safe. We help women gain healthier lifestyles by um, providing information on violence. We do ODERA scores, so those are risk as, a risk assessment tool. So the woman might not be aware that violence tends to escalate or what her risk at the current point is or what her risk to her children is. So we help them with that. We tell them what options they might have. We do referrals to other helpers and we do advocacy. So those are ki the kinds of things that the shelters do. So what is preventing shelters in the NWT right now from doing the top level work that they really need to do to keep women safe? And at this point, I have to say the shelters in the NWT, with the exception of our shelter in Yellowknife, are not adequately funded. And shelters are funded at a wide variety of levels. So if you look across the board at the shelter, the five shelters, you will find funding from 266,000 up to our funding of like 680,000. So you see a wide span of funding. And the funding is not tied to the number of beds. It's not tied to the cost in the community to buy food. It, there is no methodology that drives the funding to shelters, and there's no mechanism in place to provide any kind of regular increases. So, for example, the increases seem to be tied to the Family Violence Action Plan. So every time we come to do a presentation, maybe then it will be improved. So the last funding increase was 2011. And I actually remember going in Mark's work warehouse here to thank Floyd Rowland for doing a funding increase for the shelters as he was leaving his term as premier because it was so important and so key. And they haven't had an increase since then for the shelters outside of Yellowknife. 
What are the consequences of underfunding for shelters? Well, marginal pay makes it difficult to not only attract staff with the skills you need, but to keep them. It means you don't have relief staff when people are out sick, and so the staff that are around, and it might be your shelter manager, are overworked or working multiple shifts. Um, it might mean that training is eliminated or cut back or that safety is jeopardized because we've had shelters closed for periods of time when they didn't have enough money to make it through the fiscal year or to be open over Christmas. The health standards are jeopardized. Maybe the mattresses haven't been replaced in 20 years or they don't have a vacuum cleaner, which are two real examples we encountered this summer where I used our donation funds to replace mattresses in one of the shelters outside of Yellowknife and to buy a vacuum cleaner that they hadn't had in their history. The responsible agency may not want to keep being the responsible agency running that shelter because they don't get coverage for any of the risks they assume or for insurance. Um, the community loses faith in the shelter's ability to help women, and fewer women who are in life-threatening situations might come to the shelter because of that. So what do we need to do in the NWT? What we are recommending is that we develop and introduce a funding formula for the shelters that accounts for bed size and different costs in shelter operations. And it would take into account, for example, shelters that own their own buildings that have particular maintenance requirements or where that shelter has to pay the utilities. And it allows for regular increases so they can, can uh, keep staff and to support upgrading uh, the frontline staff skills and for governance skills for the board members. So I just want to leave you with Shelters are lifelines for women and children, and we need to keep those lifelines strong and resilient so that they are there when women need them. So I'll turn it back over to Lorraine. Thank you, uh, Ms. Fuller. Ms. Ms. Veneff? Um, next on will be Laura Boalo. She uh, is the coordinator for NUJ program, which is a community-based program for men who have abused. Uh, she works with the Tree of Peace. Thank you. Um, Ms. Fenef, Ms. Bolu. Good afternoon. I want to say thank you so much for this opportunity uh, for us to present on this really important topic that affects so many Northerners. So again, my name is Laura Buello, and I'm a registered professional counselor uh, and the coordinator and lead facilitator for A New Day, which is a pilot program for men who have used abuse and violence in their <coughs> relationships. I've also been on the Coalition Against Family Violence for the past five years, and I've worked with victim services. Presently, I also serve those who have been impacted by residential school in my private counseling practice. So this gives me a really broad view of the proportion of trauma, family violence, sexual abuse, addictions, and the impacts of residential schools that affect all Northerners. As you've heard, the rates of family violence are staggering in the Northwest Territories. And we have very few or underfunded services to address this epidemic. The Coalition Against Family Violence canvassed communities and found that counseling was a high priority for community members. After 10 years of research and advocacy, this led to the creation of A New Day, a two-year pilot program for men who have previously used violence in their relationships. In the first year of operations, this specialized community-based counseling service has served more than 130 clients in the first year, leading to significant behavioral changes to repeat offenders. The benefits of this as a community-based program is that men don't have to wait until they're charged to reach out for help. They don't have to wait until they're involved in the justice system in order to realize that they have a problem and they need to reach out and make some changes for themselves. The need is so great that we often get calls from outside of Yellowknife for clients wanting help in their home communities, and yet there's nothing to help these men who desperately need the help to change their behavior. 
we find that we get calls from other communities. When men are in Yellowknife, they also drop into our office. So as part of the recommendations of the coalition, the key priority is on healing. We suggest that we need to continue to work with these men who are reaching out to end the cycle of violence and ensure that women and children are safe. So this primary recommendation on healing is to build on the current success of this specialized family violence program by funding permanent community-based counseling services for those who have used, experienced, and witnessed family violence. And in doing so, we can prevent future violence of repeat offenders. So to build on the success of this pilot program means making it a permanent ongoing service. We need to invest in specialized counseling services, also for those who have experienced and witnessed violence. The coalition recommends that we build on the success of Project Child Recovery, which is a YWCA program that works with children who have witnessed family violence. Currently, there are no other community-based counseling services for those who have experienced the trauma of family violence or those who have witnessed family violence. A New Day as a two-year pilot is the only community-based counseling service in Yellowknife that addresses those who have used violence in the past. So the coalition recommends that community-based counseling services are provided for all those who have used violence, who have experienced violence, and who have witnessed family violence. We also recommend that these programs develop a strategy to roll out to communities outside of Yellowknife because we know that this has far-reaching implications outside of city limits. Secondary recommendations to address healing after incidents involves partnering with the Law Society to develop and implement specialized training packages for those who work in the justice system and community helpers so that we can explain the dynamics of family violence and offer tools of finding helpful ways of engaging with victims and being more supportive. We also recommend that specialized courts, such as the Domestic Violence Treatment Options Court, involve multiple appropriate referral programs and include referrals to separate services for victims, as currently we do not have that. With your support, we can help communities heal from the devastating impacts of prior family violence incidents in a holistic way that addresses the needs of entire families and communities. By prioritizing permanent community-based counseling programs for those who have used, experienced, and witnessed violence, we can end the cycle of violence. We can prevent murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls, and the Northwest Territories can be a leader in addressing this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mouyou. Um, I guess before we go on, I'd, I'd like to point out that we had two ministers in, in the room with us today. Uh, uh, Ms. Cochran, uh, Minister Responsible for Status of Women and the NWT Housing Corporation, among other portfolios. Uh, and we also have um, Mr. Siebert, uh, Minister Responsible for Justice. Uh, Mr. Abernathy would have also been here, Minister Responsible for Health and Social Services and Persons with Disabilities and Seniors, but is traveling today. So with that, I'd like to open the floor to uh, the members of the Assembly if they wish to ask any questions on the presentations we just heard. Mr. Van Thine. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Not necessarily a question, but certainly a comment. And, and uh, to, to say thank you, first of all, for coming out and presenting uh, to us today on uh, obviously a very important subject matter. Um, it wasn't long ago that uh, we were in an election campaign and um, social ills of our territory were at the forefront of uh, virtually every public forum that we had. And so uh, we've taken a lot of what uh, we've heard during that campaign and what we've seen, obviously, as residents of the North and as elected officials. And we've brought that into our, our priority-making process. And uh, we've handed a lot of that over to our respective ministers to start to develop our mandate. And uh, now the mandate is going through its due diligent process and I can uh, say that the timing is probably uh, very good uh, in that we will be going through um, a kind of a second review of our, our mandate coming up very shortly. 
and to be able to uh, outline the um, uh, key, uh, three key points that you have and, and uh, add in there uh, very distinct information as it relates to actions, the strategies, and the rationale for those is uh, very informative. I know for myself personally, and I expect the others in the room uh, can now go into our uh, uh, mandate meetings comfortably and be able to cross-check and cross-reference what you are, are proposing and uh, do our best to uh, inject that into the mandate. So once again, thank you for coming and presenting today. Thank you, uh, Mr. Van Thine. Um, Ms. Fanuk, would you like to comment on what the member has just indicated? Ms. Ms. Uh, I would agree that um, during the, the election campaign, there was a lot of talk about family violence, and I felt that, you know, it was at the key, it was at the front and key of the discussions. Um, I'm very excited to hear that um, the priorities are looking to include family violence and that they've been passed over to the, the ministers to maybe implement some of our um, suggestions. Um, I would like to, to caution that although we have presented three recommendations, there are many uh, facets of family violence that we have probably not addressed today and we will be forwarding uh, a complete kind of action plan that we're currently working on sometime in April, May. Um, we were really interested in meeting with the priorities and planning because we really wanted family violence to be on the agenda and to be something that um, just so that you could hear from people who are working at the, uh, through the service providers exactly what women, children and men are facing every day in the Northwest Territories. And due to our logistics, um, some of the, the services become a little more scattered because um, of small populations and remoteness. So although we have prepared these three for you today, there probably will be more coming. Is all I'm saying. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Ms. Funuf, uh, Mr. Tesler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to thank the, the coalition for presenting today. This issue, um, as, as I think everyone in the Northwest Territories is aware, has reached a point that, that's no longer acceptable. And um, uh, the priorities document that we've agreed on and released uh, mentions it as a family vi violence crisis. Not a problem, not a situation, but a crisis. So you, you can be assured that the members of this, of the 18th Assembly, have recognized how serious this is and uh, are going to be working towards uh, meaningful action. I had some questions um, based on your recommendations. The first being about the shelter formula funding. Does it exist in other jurisdictions? And if so, is, are there models you can recommend for us to our committees to, to uh, look at and develop our own, our own model to work with here? Thank you, uh, Mr. Testart. Uh, Ms. Fuller. So, th thanks. <laughs> um, yes, there are models in other parts of Canada, and there is a, there is a, a board of women shelters um, for Canada, and I've been in contact with the other provinces and asked them to um, pass along to me funding formulas that they use. So I'm getting that information now. And I have to say I'm really impressed with what Quebec has come up with. Um, their funding formula, I think, is one that might well work here. But I would be quite happy to work with whomever in the department to look at uh, funding formulas and make a, you know, a firm recommendation around that. But yes, there are other ones that exist. Uh, and I'm asking the shelters on the ground in those provinces, you know, does it work well? What are the shortcomings of it? Or do you really find that it's very effective? And we, you know, there are 400 shelters across the country and we've only got five. so we can probably figure this out based on that information and, and make a real difference before shelters close here, because that's what worries me. Thank you, Ms. Fuller. Mr. Testard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the other thing I think we need to be very mindful of is the, uh, the effects of intergenerational trauma. And uh, uh, 
we've, we've heard a lot about the, the New Day program and, and the, the need for community-based counseling programs. Do, is it your opinion that we have adequate supports for, um, or support resources for children who witness violence? And uh, if so, or if not, can you, can you explain specifically what we can do for the kids who are in these homes where they're, they're seeing uh, violence and it has that, those lasting effects on them going forward in their lives? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Testart. Ms. Fuller? We've, um, we've run a program for kids who witness violence for a number of years, and it, uh, it's really helpful to get the kids together. It's a group program where they also learn from each other's experience. And we've done um, pre-testing and post-testing to see how they change and how they feel capable or not of dealing with the violence in the home. And it's fascinating to read what the kids say pre and post. But um, I'd like to see those kinds of programs widely available. We, are, we have in the past and are currently in the process of trying to set up some training through the BC Association of Transition Houses. They actually do training for this. And they've come into the territory, and I have to say the last time I remember that happening was before division, so you know how long ago that would be. But um, we're trying to get them up this spring to do training and invite uh, staff of the five shelters, and we'd probably open it up to other folks who wanted to come as well. But I'd like to see programs for kids who witness abuse widely available because it is helpful for the kids. It has um, a real positive outcome in their ability to cope with it and the fact that, uh, that they uh, discover that it's not their fault because so many kids think it's their fault or they should be able to do something to pre prevent it. And it's, it helps them clearly identify who owns that violent behavior and who needs to change it, but what they can do to keep themselves safe and what they can do to, uh, uh, you know, to promote safety in their, in their own home. I will never forget in my 30 years with working with shelters. We had an eight-year-old girl come in to one of the shelters, and she used to go to sleep wearing her shoes. And we'd say to her, why are you going to sleep with your shoes on? And she said, because it's my job to climb out of the window and get help. So that's the kind of thing, you know, the ki kids take this. It, it's very impactful on them. Thank you, Ms. Fuller. <clears throat> Mr. McNeely. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for coming and making a presentation, all three of you, and, and the audience as well. Like some of my previous colleagues said, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's a uh, high concern on, on the priority to be uh, forthcoming. I, I come from a small community, and I, I did have some experiences with an individual going from one of my communities over to Yellowknife and, and taking up residence here because of what what had happened to her. And I'm just uh, I'm just quickly uh, wondering how often does your program, because you identified you're in five communities down the valley in the territories, how often do you go to the smaller communities, meet with the leaders, frontline workers, and and so on? Thank you, uh, Mr. McNeely. Um, Ms. Fuller? Yeah. Ms. Mm -hmm. Fanef? Um, we do go to the communities uh, every chance that we can. Um, this year, the status of women went to quite a few communities um, from a contract doing the What Will It Take um, program. And there we went to communities such as Fort Good Hope, Norman Wells, Politic, um, Schmiskews. Uh, Fort Providence, various places that we went. We we're also going um, to the communities doing community health fairs and uh, uh, through the government and that also gives an opportunity for women and men and children, well not so much children, but to see the 
the information that's available throughout the territories because although we may feel that everybody knows there's EPO, emergency protection order, everybody knows there's a shelter, they do not know. So it's really important that the service provi providers go to the small communities, talk to the women, talk to the leaders. Um, sometimes you can go in a community and there's a champion there and they will bring you to every um, community organization. We just recently went to Polytech and we're very, very well um, engaged there. We were there for two days. I felt everybody knew our name. People were coming to the hotel to talk to us. So I think that the money spent going to communities is well served. And I want, just wanted to add something to Mr. Testart's um, thing, is that oftentimes when we hear stories from men and women at conferences, at round tables, it always starts when they were, not always, but usually starts when they were children. The story starts at age when they can remember. So the importance of having programs for children is crucial and can maybe be the way to change intergenerational trauma to them because, as Lida said, if they accept the violence as theirs and are not introduced to understanding that it's not their fault, they go through life with that trauma and as a result, sometimes things happen in later life. Thank you, Ms. Phaneuf. Ms. Muldoon. So part of the third recommendation, the first, the first priority in looking at healing, particularly after violence has occurred, is to have a rollout strategy for community-based counseling services in Yellowknife to train community leaders in holding groups in their own communities because we know that the, pro the problem is far greater than Yellowknife. So um, that's part of the primary ask for us and the recommendation is the success that we've had in running counseling programs here in Yellowknife, we're able to travel to the communities. Currently as, as a pilot project, we don't have that capacity. So that's one of our recommendations um, is to help us be able to bring those counseling skills to the communities, to have a train the trainer, to be able to train people to hold similar kinds of groups for men to help them talk through the issues and learn new skills to solve problems nonviolently. So that's part of it as well. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Mr. McNeely, anything further? Nothing further, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. McNeely. Mr. Nakamayak. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, it's nice to hear you've been to Politech. That's my hometown and my region. And uh, I, uh, during during the holidays, there was there was a there was a house fire in Tuck, and I believe that uh, the shelter had housed a family there. Um, some of these uh, shortfalls are they're um, unexpected, and there, there is an overhead cost. So I know everyone's talking about the prevention, and all that, but I'll focus on the on the operations part of it. Um, I see your presentation. I really appreciate it. And the next time you come and present to us, you should request that sooner. Um, bring in operations, uh, your budget, um, your shortfalls, um, the logistics of traveling with your program. I think that would be really effective and for us to see the real numbers of what your what your program entails. And uh, when you have it when you have it in front of you, that's when people are more apt to help. So seeing this is a uh, a huge issue all over the north. Um, Coming from a small community, I've seen witness a lot of that, and um, and you know I know it's it's hard work that you do. Um, it's not easy. It's never gratifying. The only time you you see it down the road is when people have become successes. Uh, everyone suffers from it in every aspect. Um, not only women and children, men as well too. And it's um, it's good to see that you're you're focusing on everybody with healing, and also uh, looking forward. Um, you know the Truth and Reconciliation Council has put out their final report. Um, those are never another avenue of funding that you can you can work with with the territorial government and the federal government too. So um, I'm, I'll be willing to help however I can. So thanks for your uh, presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nakamayak and uh, Ms. Fuller. Thanks. I'm really glad to hear that uh, the Tuck Shelter was able to do that. They are the lowest funded shelter in the entire territory, which is pretty shocking. Um, given the cost of living in, in Tuck. Um, one of the things, too, that we always try to do is draw in other money. So we have in the past been successful in drawing in federal money to do work in some of the small communities where there are no RCMP. Um, because uh, uh, we really worry about those communities, about safety. 
We are also involved with the EPOs, and we help with EPOs from all the communities across the Northwest Territories and see that as a good avenue. But it's, it's always, um, we always look for opportunities to get federal funding to help address this issue. And I was just so blown away. Um, we would have some of the women from the small communities come into Yellowknife once a year as a group. And they talk so much about what their lives were like and what help they needed. And um, I, I just really found that impactful on me to help me understand. So Tuck needs help. Thank you, Ms. Fuller. Uh, Mr. Nakamayak, anything further? Uh, one Mr. more Nakamayak. thing, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, um, the Tuck Community Corporation actually helps fund that program because of the shortfalls. So um, they're another good avenue to look at as well, too, and how you can improve the operations. Uh, and Tuck is. Um, one of the higher um, rates of violence. There's a, there's a lot of employment right now there. There's the Inuvik Tuck Highway project going on. So when when you get all this this big amount of money coming into the community, um, there's going to be good and, and, and bad impacts as well too. So thanks. Ms. Bowman. <coughs> Thank you. Um, on the issue of funding and federal funding, and even the, the GNWT's response to the calls to actions of the TRC, a new day was actually the pilot program was included in the ways that the GNWT is addressing family violence and including men in education and prevention of family violence. Um, we would love to be able to bring it on the land. We'd love to be able to apply for on the land funding. We'd love to be able to look at, I know the, the Federal Department of Justice is doing a, a long-term study. Uh, their report should be coming out, I think this week, of looking at the most effective counseling programs that are available for men, women, and children around family violence. And they find the community-based model is the most effective. Now the problem with us, and I take your point about bringing the budget, so thank you. Um, we're a pilot project. So that's set to end December of this year. So knowing that we have this deadline, it's not possible if we don't know if we can keep our doors open. We don't know if we can apply for that federal funding because we don't have a baseline to, to move from. We don't have a baseline to grow from. And so that's why it's part of the ask is to actually keep the doors open to be able to apply for that ongoing funding to address that. So thank you for that question. Thank you, Ms. Mulu. Mr. Nakamayak. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Just one more thing to that. Um, I know a lot of the organizations in NWT are, you know, when it comes to, to, to the end of the fiscal year funding, people start to worry, but uh, don't uh, continue operating the way you are like you're not going to close. So that's my advice. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMayek. Um, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you very much for coming and presenting. Um, in my former life as a regular person out in the communities, um, I was a Justice of the Peace, so I'm very familiar with the emergency protection orders. Um, and then as going through the campaign, uh, I struggled with some of the stuff that was happening in the justice system where um, individuals were going to jail so they could get treatment, and which has a huge impact on the community, the family and that. So um, I, it, I struggle with that. I have a couple of questions in regards to your guys' working relationship. Um, first of all, I guess the first question I have, is this federal funding or territorial funding that has developed this pilot project? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Thompson, Ms. Finniff? The pilot project for the A New Day is... Hey, is excuse uh, me. Um, uh, thank you, uh, oh. Ms. Finniff. Mr. Thompson? Yes, New Day. Thank you, thank you Mr. Thompson. Ms. Finniff? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, it's funded by the Community Justice um, with the territorial government. Thank you, Ms. Finniff. Mr. Thompson. Okay, so um, again, I guess the, without knowing the budget and how much has been put into it um, and the success, has there been an evaluation proposal put forward that shows that this works or doesn't work? And if so, when have they been implemented? Because you're into year two, so there should be some results to it. Thank you. Mr. Thompson, Ms. Ballou. Uh Yeah, thank you for that question. So there is, uh, we have been compiling all the statistical information from the first year. Um, that's of course gone to the, the, our, the funder, which is the Department of Community Justice. They're looking at doing a formal evaluation beginning shortly. 
Um, and we'll also be presenting our statistical information at our community engagement session on February 18th. So there's sort of a multi-stage, but the GNWT is responsible for doing a formal evaluation that was built in to the program itself. So the evaluation, um, I expect that it'll come out and that it will be uh, that it will be successful based on our first year and how much community support we have and how we're integrated in other services as well because for also for those men who may be involved with the justice system, we do make contact with probation, with child protection, with parole, um, even with NSCC, so we're fairly well integrated. Thank you, Ms. Mudu. Thank you. Mr. Thompson. Thank you. Um, I guess now for the shelters, um, have you guys, where are you guys getting your funding from? Is it just government or is it federal? Is it a mixture of private industry? Um, because you, you talked about it all over the map, the amount of money. And so who's your primary department if it's within the government of Northwest Territories? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Ms. Fuller. Our primary funding for shelters comes from the Department of Health and Social Services. And currently, it's been flowed through the local health and social service authorities. So I don't know what changes may be in the works with the integrated service delivery or whatever there, you know, that, that's happening. But it's primarily GNWT funding. Um, several of the shelters, although I don't know whether this would be all of them, but several of them have uh, get donations from the community, both in kind things and monetary donations. And some of those are targeted uh, towards specific things, like I know the shelter in Fort Smith does a Christmas dinner um, and they get donations for that. Um, we get a fair number of donations here in Yellowknife. We also solicit donations. Um, most of the shelters don't have staff who are dedicated to soliciting donations. But the primary funding comes from the Department of Health and Social Services. Thank you, uh, Ms. Fuller. Mr. Thompson, you have anything further? Yeah, just um, one more question. Well, we've had a whole bunch, but I'll share this last one. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so in regards to the funding, you say it's all over the place. How, how is it all over the place? It doesn't make any sense if, if we have five shelters, they then should be treated equally. And you say it, it's done through health and social services flowing to the local health authorities or the regional authorities, I believe. Mm -hmm. So I, maybe it's not you I should be asking this question to, but I mean, how, how you talked about the, the structure being different. So what's the lowest amount and what's the highest amount, I guess, would be the question. And, and then how is that? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Ms. Fuller. The lowest amount is for the shelter in Tuck, and it's a four-bed shelter, but it also takes in uh, children who need, um, who need care. So it, it also acts as sort of respite for foster care. Um, their funding level is 266,000. The next funded amount is uh, Inuvik, and they get around 450,000. They are, um, I believe, a 12-bed shelter. No, they're an 8-bed shelter, sorry. They're 8 beds. Um, and then there is Hay River. They get 513,000, and they have 11 beds. And then uh, Fort Smith Sutherland House has 8 beds, and they get 515. 515,000. And the shelter in Yellowknife, Allison McAteer House that we operate is 12 beds, and they are appropriately funded in my view, and they get um, 687,000. Thank you, Ms. Fuller. Mr. Thompson, are you done? Uh, yeah, I just, well, just one little last comment. Um, my mother actually worked at the shelter in Hay River for a number of years before she passed away. So I know the good work that you guys do in there. So uh, I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Uh, Mr. Blake. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'd just like to thank you all for all the work you do. Um, you know, just thinking back, um, I think we could 
go through our numbers from the mid 80s I know uh, back then there were actually uh, shelters in the communities like Sigichik I believe Fort McPherson as well and you know um, I know we've come a long way since then but it seems our funding hasn't but uh, you know I, I think that as we move forward our social programs can look into the numbers that were given to the this department back then and uh, work closely with your coalition as we move forward thank you thank you uh, mr. Blake uh, <coughs> the uh, chair of the uh, social programs is uh, mr. Thompson so in, th in the future if you guys wish to engage with the social programs and members there are six members in here on the social programs uh, are there any other uh, questions or comments from uh, Ms. Cochran? Um, I think uh, I just wanted to point out, I mean, everybody knows the fiscal constraints upon the GNWT, so I'm not going to put that out there. And the people that are presenting know I'm honest, strength and fault. So. <laughs> um, and you also know that I'm really keen on, on healing and, and the, the effects of residential school and all of that stuff, and I really see family violence is really linked into that within the territories as well. Um, we have 33 communities, and um, I hear Laura when you were saying about you know training people, and my worry is about the capacity. So I'm wondering if there was, have you given any thought to kind of like a EAP program that people can at least phone in, and um, would you be able to speak on that and bring us, if you could bring us uh, a budget of what it would cost to provide that sort of service, versus and also the budget to have. Um, counseling supports in every single community what that would look like I think right we can probably guess about the shelter cost based on what you've given us we could probably look in the range that might be something we could work on but really um, I'm just trying to be honest and trying to say what can we do with the limited resources we have so if you could address that maybe if you could do the possibility and if you could bring the budget that would be helpful thank you Ms. Cochran thank you, Ms. Baldu. Thank you for that opportunity to address the budget. So to what would it look like to have counselors in every community? I'd certainly have to get back to you on, on what that might look like. But I think that there are ways of working with what we already have without too much more of an additional investment, like you say, EFAPs, um, and even the Health Canada program, so the federally funded program for those who have been impacted by residential school, it could be rolled into that as well. So there are lots of different options of ways of um, providing the service without too much additional cost, but I'll for sure come back with the exact numbers. I think that having um, a local, if it's in Yellowknife, because we do have more infrastructure, to have a center, a counseling center in Yellowknife that can provide phone contact, which because we already do, right? People already do call in to a new day. That's women and men call in a new day um, to ask questions and to get help and to get support. Also, we go into NSCC. Um, in fact, we'll be going later on today and run open groups there. So we are reaching people outside of Yellowknife. And then they build up that relationship with the counselors. I do think it'd be of benefit for us to run on the occasional on the land programming in the 33 communities and encourage the supports that are already in available in the communities. I mean, we know that yes, men use violence, but we also know there are good, strong, positive, healthy men in communities. And so I think having a centralized counseling place in Yellowknife while still having contact with the 33 communities can help build up that capacity that already exists because there's excellent traditional knowledge as well that exists in these 33 communities to encourage men to come forward. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Bolu. Would you like to add anything, Ms. Fuller? Sure. The, the, Quebec, the Quebec model that I really quite like actually um, funds their 12-bed shelters at the amount we get in Yellowknife and then knocks off $12,000 a year for every bed under 12. And um, I just thought that was wonderful, but it would mean a real uh, increase in investment in the shelters here in the north. Thank you, Ms. Fuller. Ms. Cochran, do you have anything further? Just say thank you, both, all of you. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Cochran. Chair. Any other questions from the members? Uh, Ms. Van Thine, Mr. Van Thine. 
Mr. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. <laughs> Um, I'm intrigued under uh, prevention uh, item number two that asks for um, the potential for creation of a death review panel. And I'm wondering if um, this panel could uh, comment maybe or elaborate on that a little bit more and what that structure might look like and uh, what its effects would have on, on the reduction of family violence. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van Thijn. Ms. Phaneuf? I think we've been, you know, at the coalition looking at a death review panel for quite a few years. We've had presentations on uh, Dr. Websteel's um, theories and how it works. And I think, you know, um, it would be beneficial to have a group of people, experts on family violence, looking at deaths that happen in uh, the Northwest Territories, where you'd have nurses and the coroner and police and all different folks who work in that area all the time, because I think that it would lead us to some of the gaps. It would it would bring us to links as to how we can you know prevent further deaths. So that would be the difference between a coroner's report and a death review panel. It would be a team of people versus just the coroner, you know, responding to uh, a death that looks suspicious and that probably relates back to family violence. Thank you, uh, Ms. Phaneuf. Mr. Van Thijn? That's fine. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, seeing none, I'd like to um, uh, thank the uh, coalition for the presentation here. I'm sure that the members um, will get a lot out of this and have an opportunity to discuss this further. Um, and when, when we do see some something from you guys, we'll be more informed. So I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Members were adjourned.